Emily Dickinson was an incredibly original artist. One of the things for which she is basically always hailed is her originality, was the power of her mind. In fact, I want to quote very quickly for you, um, Harold Bloom about Emily Dickinson. He says, quote, Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman remain two of the greatest, most original of American poets, surpassing such major figures as 20th in the 20th century as Robert Frost, Wallace Stevens, T.S. Eliot, and Hart Crane. Unlike the self-printed Whitman, Dickinson rejected publication, which she called the auction of the mind of man. Like Whitman's poetry, Dickens, like Whitman, Dickinson's poetry looks simple and is very difficult. Though the kind of difficulty is very different from that of Leaves of Grass, Whitman is nuanced and evasive um, and most figurative when he proclaims he is literal. Dickinson is so cognitively original that she challenges William Shakespeare or she challenges William Blake in that regard. William Shakespeare's power of thought, quite aside from all his other gifts, are unmatchable in literature and in language. Dickinson, at her strongest, has something in her lyrics that recalls the swiftness and compression of Shakespeare's mind. There is no writer of the English language to whom someone could be compared that is quite like Shakespeare. This is like comparing a basketball player to Michael Jordan. It's like comparing a football player to Tom Brady. It's like comparing a hockey player to Wayne Gretzky. Uh, any of these types of examples that you can come up with, that's the Shakespeare of the English language. So it is needless to say that, so, so sometimes, Though Emily Dickinson's imagination and, in fact, ability to construct a poem, ability to take a conceit that is ethereal, quite frankly, and make it something that makes sense to the reader is incredible. That's out there, right? Sometimes, however, her diction is limited. You know you're in an Emily Dickinson poem. Today's poem has a little bit of a different type of diction to it, a little bit different word choice than normally we get from Emily Dickinson, and I think it really pops on the page because of that. But also, if you have been here through this series, Echoes of Emily, one of the things that I have been doing is at the end of these videos, so there's a poetry reading very early in the video with the poem displayed on screen. At the end of the video, I feed the poem into Dali, which is an AI art generating, AI image generator. And I am putting the images that AI, Dali in particular, generate on top of a reading of the poem. So the display is actually that reading. I have been super interested in the way that these things have come out. I think that's, if you have spent as much time with these poems as have I, I think it's only natural that a, an AI art, an AI image is generated on the poem just to sort of see what it looks like, right? That, that's an incredible thing. Oftentimes, classical type of art was made about Bible stories because there's something there's something to express there you have the david how would you represent the david do you put him mid fling do you put him victorious you know how how do you choose to make that image very difficult a very difficult question for emily dickinson's poems so i've been doing those that ai art project at the end of these videos None of them have made images quite like those which will be on display at the end of this video. These images, for whatever reason, the AI image generator decided to make this poem into what looks like an H.R. Geiger type of story. And it looks 
it all looks mid-story. It is a very strange phenomenon. This video is part of three separate playlists here on the channel. Number one being obviously the Echoes of Emily playlist, but number two being a playlist of Emily Dickinson poetry discussions. And third, the general playlist for poetry discussions. If you like or appreciate the work that I do here, hitting the like button really does help me out as it tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And if you find yourself here by chance but not design, literature is the only thing that I talk about on this channel, dropping multiple videos every single week. So consider hitting the subscribe button to stick around for more literature in the future. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore, and yesterday, or centuries before? The feet mechanical go round, a wooden way, of ground, or air, or aught, regardless grown, a quartz contentment, like a stone. This is the hour of lead, remembered if outlived, as freezing persons recollect the snow. First, chill, then stupor, then the letting go. Though the diction is elevated, I think that this is a fairly uh, straightforward written poem. I don't think that it is certainly as opaque as some of Emily Dickinson's poems, but still I think probably it will do us some good to kind of step by step through this. After pain, a formal feeling comes. So what this is in reference to is imagine one of these uh, great traumatizing events in your life. You've lost a loved one, you've been broken up with, the, even physical trauma. I think that this is something that could, a, a car wreck, you have um, been hit in the face, all of these sort of things. After that moment, we, with, we withdraw. And there is a I'll get into this a little bit later with one of the talking points for this poem, but in, in moments of this trauma, in moments of this type of distress, in the immediate aftermath of it, everything is quiet. Everything is calm. Everything has put on a stiff upper lip. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. You have a great distance feeling in your body. You are almost um, almost outside of everything watching what is going on on a screen. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore, and yesterday or centuries before? In this sort of absence from the moment, the and, and it would be very possible for me to use this to talk about it, it with the um, ontological uh, aspect of this poem, but there's something slightly different with these same lines that is worth pointing out. But uh, in this absence from our life, right, we have distanced from immediacy. Uh, there is that calming effect that makes, so, so like when you watch a movie, and the movie has a whole lot of highs and lows. It's a movie that makes you laugh, makes you cry, makes you uh, feel motivated, all of these different things. Those movies feel a whole lot longer than they are because of the emotional highs and lows that we have to travel to get there. The feet, mechanical, go round, a wooden way of ground or air or aught. Um, I, I think that this what this is in reference to is sort of pacing, the feet mechanical go round, a wooden way of ground or air or aught, regardless grown, a quartz contentment like a stone. Um, again, we are here talking about a nearly foreign nature to the own body. This is the hour of lead, remembered 
if outlived. The hour of lead, what is lead? Lead is not just an inanimate thing. It is very, very heavy. Meaning that in this moment, there is a great weight upon us. And we will never forget that moment if it does not kill us. As freezing persons recollect the snow, as someone who is going through... uh, Someone who is going through exposure, really, remembers the snow. It would be almost a PTSD-type experience. First chill. Oh, this is this is awful. It's really cold out here. Then stupor. I got to figure something out. I don't know what is going on. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know how. Um, if you have ever put yourself through great physical trial, you you have very poor judgment in the midst of that. Uh, go to, the, surely in your town, there is a marathon or two. Go to the finish line and ask people mathematical questions. See how many they get correct. Then we have to do this because we're an Emily Dickinson poem. We're in an Emily Dickinson poem. Then the letting go. Then the moment that we decide, oh, okay, never mind. Um, this whole waking up tomorrow thing doesn't need to happen. I'll just go ahead and tap out now, right? So th- there's a lot, <laughs> there's so much going on here. So this is the first thing that I wanted to talk about. The slap theory of social betterment. This is my own personal theory. This is something that I have spent a great deal of time considering. This is something that um, is endorsed wholly by this poem. I think, I do think this, it should be completely legal. If you can get 20 signatures, you get to slap someone. I fully believe this. If you have never had the snot knocked out of you, you don't understand how sobering that is. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. I had a concussion. I believe it was my sophomore year in high school. I was at football practice, and we were not supposed to be hitting. We were supposed to be wrapping up. And I was sent on a receiving route over the middle of the field, extended, and right in the back of the head, helmet to helmet, from a senior. Um, Got up off the ground, went back to the, the huddle, and then collapsed. This was a terrible situation in my life. I did not remember who the president was. I was not sure where I was. I had no idea, once I came to, how it was that I got there. All of these things said... I think I was better for it. Um, Not in the immediate wake of a concussion, of a late onset concussion, of a body failure type losing consciousness concussion. But it makes you think a whole lot harder about a lot of things and whether or not you want to do them. If it were legal in society, I collect 20 signatures, I get to slap you in the face. Not punch you, not um, have at you, not any of these other things. It doesn't start a fight, but if I slap you in the face and you want to slap me in the face, you get your shot, right? Like a duel. I think that this would better society. That is my own personal grandstand for this poem. We will move forward. Notice the progression here. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. The heart questions, was it he that bore in yesterday or a century before? The feet. Um, and then I think that's it. I think that's it for... Th- so on body, we have nerves, heart, and feet. Questionably... 
if you want to throw this in, I'm not sure it, it fits, but feeling is sort of extracurricular to nerves, right? We're not talking about feeling as in touch. We're talking about feeling there as in emotion. So questionably, by extension, kind of you could put the brain in there. Now, let me switch this real quick. Questionably, again, I don't know if you want to include that. We have tombs, but we also have wooden, we have ground, air, kind of we have ought. I don't, I don't know exactly how you want to question that. Then we have quartz. Then we have lead. And maybe somewhere in the middle, we have snow. Not now, snow. By the way, I did not know you could do that. I didn't know you could just click on that. I thought you had to highlight and go from there. Anyway, make fun of me if you must. We have brain, nerves, heart, feet. Boom. Nerves is kind of all over you. Boom and feet. Tombs. Tombs are stone, wood, ground, quartz, and lead. Maybe snow. I'm going to be real honest with you. I don't know what to make of this, except for the fact that what we have is we're going on to the person. This is a, I believe that is a term from burnt tongue type writing. Uh, the burnt tongue school of writing. I believe that's what that's from. On the person. Nerves, heart, feet, brain. What we are doing is starting here, really, three of those four come before a single, two of, the, two of the four come before even the questionable reference to stone. All four of them come before the first real inanimate thing, wood. Wood used to be animate. Then we have ground, air, quartz, and lead. I believe that what is going on there is we are starting with the person and we are progressing to the inanimate. So I'm not 100% positive what to do with that other than to point it out and say that it is an interesting progression. Not The actual progression of poetry is something that is often underplayed unless what you're looking at is a narrative poem. So narrative poem, Charles Bukowski writes a lot of narrative poems. It's a story on the page, but it's cut up in a pretty way. In the lack of narrative, it is easy for a poem's progression to be gimmicky. It is easy for a poem's progression to ring hollow or to be cheapened, right? So if I say, my love reminds me of my face because she is so pretty. My love reminds me of my heart because she is so regular. My love reminds me of my belly button right then then you understand that what's coming next is probably my knees that sort of cheapens a poem because it becomes not a theme it becomes not thematic but it comes it becomes predictable we don't have that here it who called quartz coming who started this poem and said, oh, okay, by stanza two, we're going to be talking about quartz. I bet you didn't. I bet you didn't. So this is, a, a, again, very interesting in the poem, but I don't know exactly what to do with it. Speaking of things I don't know exactly what to do with, this is not unusual for an Emily Dickinson poem to have a very strange rhyme scheme, but we do. 
Here we have one of Emily Dickinson's famous slant rhymes, comes and tombs. These words don't rhyme, but I mean, if you, if you see them, look away, and those words are in your periphery, they kind of look like they rhyme. If you slant your vision away, they kind of look like they rhyme. But bore and before certainly do rhyme. But grown and stone certainly do rhyme. Snow and go certainly do rhyme. The only real thematic connection that I could bring from this rhyme scheme is that it's the ending couplet. It's the last couplet that rhymes drawing emphasis to the end of each of our three stanzas. Drawing an emphasis to the end. Drawing an emphasis, then the letting go. Very fatalistic. Nihilistic interpretation. I made a promise to myself in starting off with this series. This is the last sort of hurrah to the daily uploading schedule that I will have here on the channel. I wanted to bring my love of Emily Dickinson as much to the forefront of the channel as I possibly could, and that includes a love of nihilism and a love of hauntology. In nihilistic fashion, this is one of my favorite quotes, period, let alone uh, about nihilism, we have the Russian philosopher, literary critic, Dmitry Pizarev, saying of nihilism, defining nihilism. In short, here is the ultimatum of our camp. What can be smashed must be smashed. Whatever will withstand the blow, uh, whatever will stand the blow will do. What flies into smithereens is rubbish. In any case, strike out right and strike out left. No harm will or can come of it. As we are making our way through this poem, we're trying to find something that will withstand the blow. We're trying to, we're trying to find something which is solid enough, which is good enough, which is permanent, strong, and worthy enough. We start, of course, with a feeling. That's no good. We move past it to the, the place the feelings themselves come from. Nerves. That is no good. We move, in symbolism, to mortality itself. It seems to not withstand the blow. Then we have the heart, the heart, the reason for life doesn't withstand the blow. Feet, our animalistic ways, our very existence as animals does not withstand the blow. Wood, we have technology, does not withstand the blow. Ground or air or ought, ought being uh, responsibility, ought being that thing, those things which we should do, none of them withstand the blow. Then we have quartz. Quartz does not withstand the blow. Is it the Bohr scale? B-O-H-R? The Bohr scale? How, how hard a stone is? That doesn't withstand the blow. We have to move on to lead. Does not withstand the blow. Then we get to snow. Maybe withstands the blow. But you have to understand, what percentage of the earth is water? Water that can turn to ice and snow. So it's a, if you want to look at this from a nihilistic standpoint, this poem can be very interesting. I don't know that it necessarily sets it, itself up in the way that would be um, informative or lend itself to a nihilistic reading naturally. But I think that if you are to try to um, flip the sort of 
lens of nihilism onto this poem, then there is it, there, there's something to talk about. There's something interesting happening with this poem. Now, we got to get back to nihil or to uh, hauntology. Yesterday or centuries before, we have that phrase here. The stiff heart, the stiff heart questions. Was it he that bore? And yesterday, yesterday or centuries before. One of the things which ontology deals with uh, pretty extensively is this sort of, I don't want to say misdiagnosed. I don't want to say mysterious. I want to say perhaps, um, almost androgynous, an almost androgynous sort of sensibility towards time. That is to say, when you look at time in a hauntological fashion, you're not sure where you're looking. You have to pick up on clues, much in the same way that you would have to do in this poem. The, the stiff heart questions, was it he that bore, and yesterday or centuries before. In this situation, the individual would have to be looking around at context clues in order to figure out what the time is. Where did this thing happen? When did this thing happen? This great pain. How long have we endured? That is the question that is raised in this, the first stanza of the poem, and sets the rest of the poem up to have a hauntological interpretation. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore, and yesterday, or centuries before? The feet mechanical go round, a wooden way, of ground, or air, or aught, regardless grown, a quartz contentment, like a stone. This is the hour of lead, remembered, if outlived, as freezing persons recollect the snow. First, chill then stupor, then the letting go.